Paul Gilbert is a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Derby. Paul has pioneered compassion-focused therapy, CFT, the aim of which is to help those with mental health problems use compassion to help alleviate their mental distress. Paul's research has shown that the ability to develop compassion towards ourselves and others can have a profound impact on our minds, our health, our happiness, and the people to whom we relate. Along with Mindful Compassion, which is the book he has recently released, Paul is also the author of The Compassionate Mind and Overcoming Depression. Would you please make him welcome? From reading Paul's book and seeing him on a number of YouTube uh, videos, I think he's a good bloke too. <laughs> so let's start at the beginning. It's very nice to have the opportunity to speak with you. Very nice to be here. When we talk about compassion, what are we talking about? Oh, well, it's a great opener of that because uh, a lot of people think compassion is about uh, sort of weakness or softness. Um, <clears throat> Uh, compassion really can be defined in terms of a sensitivity to suffering and self and others, turning towards, taking an interest in, being prepared to engage, plus an ability to learn what to do to alleviate that suffering. So it has two elements to it, this preparedness to turn towards, to notice, to engage with suffering in yourself and others, and a preparedness to develop the wisdom to alleviate or prevent it. So if you're going to be a doctor, for example, the first element is the desire to be helpful to people and engage with their suffering, that's very important. But then you have to spend X number of years studying how to be uh, good at what you do in this skill. So compassion involves these two basic um, psychologies. It's not enough to understand the nature of suffering, because I know in the beginning of, of uh, uh, your book, you talk about the Four Noble Truths within Buddhism and the notion that that we all suffer, but there is also this further element that we put ourselves in the position to do something about it. And to do something about it wisely. For example, if I see somebody fall into the ocean and uh, I think, oh my gosh, I'm going to save them, they're going to drown. So I jump in and then I realise, actually I can't swim. <laughs> That's what we call unskillful compassion. So it's using... There's another name for it, I think, too. <laughs> It's the preparedness to acquire the wisdom to, to address the issues. It's not just desire, it's putting the commitment to address, address the issues. Right. Yeah. In, in a moment I'm going to come back to, to how we get that wisdom and, and the nature of our minds, because mm. that's obviously mm. fundamental mm. to your work. But I would like to now just touch on a definition of mindfulness. My mm. first exposure to the idea, the concept of mindfulness, was through John Kabat-Zinn. And I just made a note of his definition, which is paying attention on purpose in the present moment. Does that satisfy your understanding of it? Yes, I mean, it's kind of interesting uh, with our judgment, I think John would uh, say as well. I mean, the, the interesting thing about mindfulness is um, there are different dimensions to it. So uh, we often start with the fact that you only exist in the present moment. You don't exist in the moment to come, and you don't exist in the moment just gone, because that's gone. So this concept of uh, mindful awareness of the present moment is because that's the only place you actually exist. You don't exist anywhere else. But our minds are often taken into planning and worrying and thinking about the future or regretting and ruminating the past. And so we move away from the present moment. And so mindfulness helps us to live where we actually exist. The other aspect of mindfulness, which is really interesting, is the fact that it's a form of awareness that we suspect, we don't know, we suspect that no other animal has. And this is the awareness of awareness. You're conscious of being conscious. It's that, re it's that recursive system, which is really interesting in, 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 interesting in mindfulness. And so that ability to be aware of, wow, this is consciousness. I am aware of being here right now. I'm aware of you. I'm aware of my voice. This awareness of awareness is really quite an amazing phenomena that we think, you know, that only the human brain is capable of. Just on existing too, one of the interesting things, and it was slightly unnerving, I have to say, because I got out my pocket calculator. At the beginning of your book, you acknowledge that we're not here forever. You know, again, all things must pass. And you basically make the point that you know, most middle-class people will live between 
25,000 and 30,000 days. Yes. Um, I'm just about to knock over 21,000. Yes. And I thought, wow, I'm going to make the most of the next bit because, you know, according to Paul, <laughs> my days truly are numbered. Um, <laughs> the, the idea now of, of our minds, one of the things that I really latched on to immediately is when you say that we're not completely responsible for our minds, that 200,000 years of evolution has given us a mind that you basically say it's not all our fault. Yes. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, well, that's, that's, a, that's a great, great issue, really. It's an important issue. <clears throat> so the human brain, I mean, the, the key thing is that humans are a species like any other species. We've arrived here on this planet as a result of an evolutionary journey. So we call this, we are part of the flow of life on this planet, in this universe at this time. We are a species of primate. Primates are a species of mammals. Mammals are a species of life, right? So the human brain and the human body have been evolving over many millions of years, and they contain within them the blueprints of all that has gone before, much of what has gone before. So we have a brain that is capable of all kinds of stuff, right? Things that have actually advanced the evolution of mammals and primates. So we have a capacity for being scared of tigers and lions and running away, threat focused, we have an ability to um, look after our own young, we can be very competitive, we can live within hierarchies, we are interested in sex obviously, otherwise that would be the end of us, if we were interested in sex there would be no more of us, wouldn't there really? So you have to be, have these basic motivational systems. The, the problem is, and I think what you're alluding to Mike, is the, is the fact that um, we also have this human brain which allows us to think, reason, anticipate, plan, and have a sense of self, you know. And humans are capable of self-monitoring in a way that no other animal is. And so we can monitor anything. So you never see a chimpanzee sitting under a tree taking their pulse, thinking, oh my God, that's far too quick, I'm gonna have a heart attack. You know? um, or looking in the lake and worrying about putting on weight. But humans monitor, <laughs> The, anything. They can also monitor their own thoughts, they can also monitor their own behaviours and they can become very self-critical, which often that self-criticalness and self-dislike can be a source of a lot of unhappiness. So we have a brain that can do wonderful things, but also a brain that actually can really tie us up in knots and cause a lot of suffering. So, so does that bring us back to that perennial issue of nature as opposed to nurture? And what we know is that the the human mind and the human body are very flexible and they will fit into whatever niche they are kind of born into. So we often use the example that, you know, if I had been kidnapped as a three-day-old baby into a violent drug gang, what version of Paul Gilbert would exist? Well, certainly not this one. I would be likely to be much more violent and aggressive because that would have been my background. So we are very much, not only are we created by our genes, we have brains that are designed by evolution with anger and anxiety and lust and all that designed in it, but we were also created by our social contexts that we don't choose. And so as you point out, the key issue is recognizing just how much of what goes on up in here is not of our design and not of our choice. So, so within the brain, you've already <coughs> touched on that we have this almost primordial fear response. We, we have the whole flight or fight that, and that's you know based on our evolutionary history where mm. various times mm. the prospect of the alligator in the billabong meant that we had to, you know, move pretty sharply. Mm. Can we talk about the other elements? So, because I understand it's very important in your work to look at, there is a soothing element as well. There's not only a defensive aspect to our minds, but there is um, uh, other elements that we can bring this mindfulness to bear upon, that we can actually change our minds, if that's not too far a step. I think that's extremely important that mindfulness allows us to understand what's going on and begin to make choices about what kinds of minds we want to cultivate. Um, because basically our minds will develop according to whatever context, whatever genes we have, but we don't necessarily make a decision to cultivate a kind of mind that we want. So in the system we work, we have three basic systems. One is your threat system, as you say, which is automatic. Nobody practices that. Nobody thinks to themselves, you know, I need to practice panic. I don't have enough panic in my life. Or I need to practice rage. Uh, so the threat system is an automatic system that comes on very quickly. And sometimes that can come on even when we don't want it to. 
Then you have a system which is linked to drives and desires, which activates you and gets you excited. But as you say, we also have this other system, which is a soothing system, which allows us to calm down. It creates a sense of contentment. And when we're not in drive and we're not in um, threat mode, and that system has a really powerful influence on how our minds are organized. It affects how the frontal cortex, as part of our mind, works. It affects how we're able to solve problems and be creative. So if you're wanting to cultivate uh, a mind, one of the things to cultivate is the ability to find this stillness, this quietness, this what you would call the mindfulness, the mindfulness stillness within, which then allows the mind to settle. And then when your mind settles, you have clearer insight. Because one of the examples you give, Paul, <coughs> it's a slightly racy one, so it's fun to talk about, is that notion that we can use our mind to create changes in our body. We can. We can lie in bed, not that I've ever done it, and think sexy thoughts and experience arousal. We can affect a physical change through mental processes. So is that a slightly risque example of the fundamental notion that we can train our mind, we can develop aspects of our mind to increase our ability to develop those characteristics, those self-soothing, self-respectful, other respectful elements to our mind. Absolutely. We now know there are two key themes in the human brain. We now know that the brain is actually much more flexible and plastic than we thought. And uh, we also have uh, new neurons are being born every day. It's called neurogenesis. And those neurons go to places where they're being activated and used. So we now know that if people practice things, they change their mind. So if you decide to take up the violin, for example, um, and you practice every day, areas of your brain to do with finger coordination will literally grow. Right? So we know this. Um, so if we're stimulating our minds with certain kinds of fantasies, certain kinds of ideas, we will be having an impact on those pathways. So you're absolutely right. If you lay in bed and you think of something a bit naughty, not that you would, because you're not that sort of person, obviously. Um, <laughs> Thanks, um, <I> <laughs> uh, Yeah, one of, my, one of my patients said, I know what you mean, Dr. Gilbert. He said, I much prefer fantasy, because you meet a better class of person. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, so we can stimulate things. Now, the, so, and if you're laying in bed thinking of things that are worrying you, or frightening you, then you're constantly stimulating your threat system. But of course, if you're focusing on compassion-focused themes, then you'll be stimulating those areas of your brain. And those areas, over time, and there's quite a lot of research on this, loving kindness meditation does literally change your brain. In one of the, the videos, uh, and you've explained to me it's German research, there is this most remarkable experiment where a toddler, uh, literally a child that is barely able to stand up and walk, displays uh, the active enthusiasm to help someone. Could you just if you could take us through that and why that is significant, why our capacity to cooperate is a very special part of being human. The key thing is that humans are mixed, right? We have, we have a, a very positive side, but we also have a dark side, of course. We can be very tribal, we can be very aggressive, we can be very cruel. And it, when we look at the history of humanity, we tend to see quite a lot of that. And we can forget that actually we've also got medicine and teaching kinds of things, and that humans also have the motivation and the desire to be helpful to others and to play a part in helping others solve problems, to help them reach their goals, and that this motivational system is detectable in children from a very early age, the desire to be helpful to another. And you're referring to some of the work that was done in Thomas Sellers' laboratories uh, by Winnica, um, where one of them is where you show somebody dropping a peg and this little toddler who can hardly walk gets walks up and picks the peg up and hands it to the person, yeah. So and, and is happy to do so. And is happy to do so. That's really extremely important, isn't it? That actually the pleasure of being useful to other to another, this is something that's really very important. And children enjoy doing things that are going to be helpful to others. I think you go on in that talk to then say, and I wrote it down, that compassion, and I quote you here, is not airy-fairy, wiffly-waffly stuff. That's a technical term. It, it's not fluffy stuff. Compassion is based on very hard scientific understanding about how our brain actually regulates itself. So compassion is, is rooted in a very basic motivational system of caring and taking an interest 
and the well-being of others. Okay, and that is ancient. That goes back many millions of years. It probably begins with attachment when the parent is paying attention to the distress call, like you know, birds pay attention to the squawks of the the chicks and feed them and so on. So the ability to pay attention to the distress of another and to do something about it. That's very ancient, that's rooted deep in the human brain, and it has uh, it sort of expanded out with human evolution so that we have this interest in being helpful to others and taking pleasure in being so. We also talk about soft compassion and hard compassion, that, that it's easier to be compassionate towards those, towards those that we like, that we love, mm -hmm. but it would be much more challenging to extend compassion to say someone we don't like, mm. um, which I have to say is, is, is a very much a lapsed um, Catholic, <coughs> immediately brought to mind that, that Christian notion of, of turning the other cheek, that, that in, in the face of someone that you, is really challenging and, you, and challenging you and who you don't like, that you still, there is an expectation that you still might show that person compassion, which I think for many people is a much bigger challenge to, sh to be compassionate towards a person that they don't like. In therapeutic terms, why is that important to get to that point where we can extend compassion, not only to those we love, but for those that we don't like? That's a great question. So certainly within the Christian traditions, there are two things about compassion. The compassion in the condition, Christian traditions are based on intense courage, because whether or not you believe that Christ was the Son of God or not, the fact of the matter is that he believed, and the tradition believes, that he was coming to save individuals and was prepared to put himself through enormous suffering in order to do that. That's an act of extraordinary courage and self-sacrifice, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is not to be vengeful. Not to be vengeful. So the point, you know, you remember the story on the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. That actually, if you do meditations on that, has multiple levels. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Because there's also a Buddhist position, which is, the unenlightened mind doesn't understand what it's doing and why it's doing what it's doing. Right? So um, that's a really important point. So the, 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 the issue then is becoming um, vengeful to those that you hate. That is a biological uh, process and you can act on that if you want. And unfortunately humans are very troubled and they do it all the time. But if you want to have a compassionate world which has peace in it and has cooperation in it, then it's absolutely essential we use our intelligence to recognize that. We have to override our emotional motivational dictates and reach out to have compassion for those who we may not like. So a good example of this was um, after the Second World War, we had the Marshall Plan in Europe, which rebuilt Germany. Rebuilding your enemy was understood to be a really important thing. Don't humiliate your enemy, which is what we did after the First World War, because that created the seeds for fascism. Rebuild your enemies, support them. If only we could do that in other places of the world, I think we would have solved quite a lot of conflicts. I'd like to talk about self-compassion now, yeah. because, again, uh, there's, there's courage in self-compassion. So what I took from your book and from your lectures, it's that, as you say in one lecture, it's not about letting yourself off the hook. It's not about, I think you give the example of someone suffering from agoraphobia. So being compassionate to yourself doesn't mean retreating with the <coughs> chocolates towards the television, mm. it actually might mean challenging yourself to go public, literally. Mm. Could, could I get you to elaborate on that, those notions of self-compassion and how, how we actually undertake being compassionate to ourselves? I think this is a great point because some people think that compassion is about being soft on oneself. You know? So as you say, you know, if you're an agoraphobic, then why not be nice to yourself and go and sit on the couch and have a warm hot bath and be gentle and eat chocolates and well that's okay um, but that isn't what we mean by compassion so compassion is paying attention to your suffering and doing something about it that's compassion so if you act about it then understanding the nature of the difficulty and then doing something about it and that requires courage so the courage to engage with what it with, with the causes of your suffering the courage to engage with the causes of other people's suffering certainly the courage to engage with your own suffering is very important. So the agoraphobic, the compassionate act is to make a commitment that every day I will try and go out, every day I will try to confront my anxiety until I overcome it. But, but also I imagine in, in a forgiving way that we don't, we don't punish ourselves for our failures or perceived inadequacies. 
Very much so. So the, the key issue with all of these things is developing a friendly, supportive, internal process, right? Because if you're trying to be, if, if, you're, if you're an agoraphobic trying to engage with the anxiety as you go out and you have a hostile voice in your head that says, come on, you know, what's the matter with you? Nobody else is frightened like you. You're very coward. You just get out there and pull yourself. That kind of voice is really just going to make you very stressed and you're not going to cope. But if you have a friendly voice in your head that says, well, it's very difficult. This is agoraphobia. It's not your fault. Just take it easy. We're going to step inside, see how far we can go. That friendly, encouraging, supportive approach you're much more likely to succeed if you do that than if you hammer yourself, criticize yourself. So, so in that sense, am I right in thinking that kindness is part of compassion? Kindness is part of compassion, yes it is. It's an emotional texture of compassion, yes. Right. Another thing that I found very interesting were the actual physical techniques that can help people uh, put themselves into a better mental state. And I think, is it Kristen Neef? has also done some research onto this. Um, but in one of your lectures, you basically take the audience through the development of, of that, of, of acknowledging themselves, of, of changing the tone of their voice, bringing in a friendly, compassionate tone towards you, that you know, and, and And the significance of slowing down the mind. Could yes. I get you to elaborate on that? Okay, so those are two interesting points. I mean, the, the, the first is that the voice tone has a really major impact on your uh, amygdala, which is a threat system, your voice tone. So if you think about how does a mother talk to a baby when she's soothing and calming, right? The, 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 so the, the voice tone is really quite, quite important. And we discovered this when we were working with clients many years ago, depressed clients who felt inferior and failures and worthless. And so we would do some cognitive work and we'd help them think, well, actually, you've achieved here and you have a husband or a wife that loves you and you have children and so on and so on. And what we discovered is that they could do that cognitive stuff, but they would often have a very hostile um, self-talk. So it would be, come on, pull yourself together. I mean, you've got children that love you, for God's sake, what's the matter with you? you know? So they would do all the rational stuff, but in a very hostile way. So we would just teach them to have a very friendly voice. And they found that extremely helpful. The idea of a friendly voice, just that, that was very sensitive to their suffering. It was very, very hard for them. They would start to cry, no one's ever been kind to me before, I don't think I deserve kindness, all of that stuff. So that was very important. Um, so vo voice, tone is, voice tone is extremely important. And one of the ways in which you create it is to actually practice this process of slowing the mind of slowing down by slowing the breath, breathing deeper and slower than you would normally, allowing yourself to settle, and then just really creating in your mind a friendly voice. So what you might say to start with is just on the out-breath, learning to say hello to yourself. So my name is Paul, so on the out-breath I might just say, hello Paul, in a very welcoming way, just practicing that voice as opposed to hello Paul. You know, it's <laughs> I mean, just don't speak to me like that. <laughs> don't speak to me like that. <laughs> um, yeah, so having this friendly and really focusing on the fact that voice tone is very important. And then we know that because people can say things like to you, and the voice tone is whether it upsets you or whether it doesn't. So somebody can say, oh, don't be so silly. Or they can say, don't be so silly. You know, that hostile, don't be so silly, is very different to a very friendly tone system. You know. An Englishman was asked how he found being in America, where at every turn people are wishing you a nice day, have a nice day. And I remember he stopped and he said, well, I have to tell you, being told have a nice day by someone who doesn't really mean it is still much better than being told to sod off by someone who does. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Which does actually lead me into deserved compassion. Yeah, yeah. Can I get you to talk about what you mean by it? and what it's distinct from. Aristotle has uh, three concepts of compassion. was the fact that compassion is for non-trivial suffering. So he gave an example of a Roman Empire who had lost a shipment of larks, tongues, in a storm for his birthday. So he was very upset about that. And Aristotle says, so we probably wouldn't have compassion for an emperor who was upset about losing things for his birthday. 
So it has to be non-trivial. Uh, the other thing Aristotle says, we have to be able to make some sense of the suffering. We have to have an empathic connection. Though he didn't use that word, obviously, because that was a much later word. But the other thing is that we have to think of it as uh, non-deserved. So the question of non-deserved is part of the Aristotle tradition. The question of deserves part of the Aristotle tradition in a way that it isn't of the Buddhist position. The Buddhists don't have issues about whether uh, suffering is deserved or not. That doesn't really matter. Suffering is suffering and you seek to alleviate it, whatever its cause. So it's an interesting question, this. And, of course, a lot of religions that are based upon deities then have deities who make a decision about who is deserving and who isn't, who goes to heaven, who goes to hell, who are the good, who are the bad, and all that. So the issue of deservedness is very important in certain kinds of hierarchical structures. But in the Buddhist system, the issue of deservedness and compassion doesn't arise. So, so the good-bad dichotomy mm. is not significant? Not, not in, the, in the Buddhist traditions, no. Okay. Now, not now, in terms of suffering. Right. And, and in terms of compassion as flow, you, you give sort of examples of there's um, other to self, uh, self to other, Yes. And then self to self. Yes. Does the nature of compassion change in those flows, or is the idea that we can establish a compassionate relationship with ourselves and with others? The point about flow is that you can have fierce blocks of resistance in any of those. So you can have some people who are very compassionate to themselves, they're not very compassionate to other people. Uh, whereas other people can be very compassionate to other people, but they're not very compassionate to themselves. And sometimes people are not very sensitive to the compassion of others. They're not, they're not able to be grateful to others for their help. Or they have beliefs like, well, if you really knew about me, if you really knew what went on in my head, you wouldn't like me. So even though you like me, it's only because you don't really know. So there are all kinds of ways in which people block up the flow of compassion. They block up being compassionate, maybe because the people they feel people don't deserve compassion, or they feel, well, they're too distant from me, or I, you know, I can't be bothered with them, or whatever. They block up the flow of compassion from others because they feel they don't deserve it, or because the other person's only being nice because they want to be nice. And they block up the flow of self-compassion because they feel that they're bad in some way, or they don't know how to be self-compassionate. So, so one of the things, Paul, is that we have to learn to be open to receiving the compassion of others. I think that's something very, very important. And one of the important things, I think, in the compassionate movement is to think about compassion as flow, because sometimes with the mindfulness um, focus, there really can, can be a sense that it's all to do with what's going on in your own head, as opposed to actually it's about how you are not only in your own head, but how you are in a community, how you are with other people, how open you are to them, how interdependent you realize that you are, that your well-being depends upon the so many other people, and their well-being depends upon people around them as well. So we, this concept of interdependency, I think, is a really important concept in compassion. Now, now I'm possibly heading off onto thin ice now because I'm not uh, trained in Buddhist studies, but I'm interested in, just at a personal level possibly, ideas of self and other, whereas I am under possibly the misapprehension that within Buddhism, Part of the objective is a denial of self. One of the ways in which the Buddhists um, think about self and other is this idea of that your mind is like water, right? Water can contain a medicine or a poison, but it isn't that. Your mind is like a spotlight, it can light up many things, but it's not the thing it lights up. And so when we have a sense of self, this is to do with content, the content of mind. And content of mind is created by the biological form. Our biological forms create content, genes create content, brains create content within mind. Um, the fact that we have an eye that can see certain light frequencies means that we can see certain colors, but most of the frequencies of energies we, we, we will never have an experience of. So this issue of content, so in terms of content, there's very much a sense of self, and that's really quite important because that, that sense of self coheres and brings content together in a way that organizes content so if you're organized around compassion, that organizes your mind in a certain kind of way. However, this isn't to be confused with the nature of mind in the Buddhist sense, which is the focus on the water, <laughs> which is formless. Sometimes it's talked about as being empty, but the Dalai Lama has recently said that it means it's formless. The 
mind, like the clear blue sky or whatever it is, is that which allows form to emerge. Um, so there's a lovely little um, story about two waves rushing to this, to this shore, a big wave and a little wave, and uh, a big wave said to the little wave, oh my goodness, you should see what's coming, it's a disaster, there are rocks ahead, we're going to be smashed to pieces. And the little wave says, no, no, you don't need to worry, we're going to be fine, we'll be okay. And the big wave says, you're only saying that because you can't see what I can see because you're little. And the little wave says, no, no, it'll be okay. And uh, the big wave says, well, you better say soon because I tell you, there's foam everywhere, it's a disaster, it's horrible. And the little wave says, well, you're not a wave, you're water. And so the Buddha's position is this understanding about the nature of mind, not the nature of content. When it comes to content, the experience of being, this biological self with these biological uh, motives and feelings and emotions and eyes that can see certain colors and ears that can hear certain frequencies, all of that is created by our biology. But when the Buddhists talk about mind, they're not talking about content, they're talking about this other dimension which may or may it's such a fantastic notion, mindful compassion. Um, I, I, the, your book, congratulations. It's, it's, I, I'm a complete lay person in this area. I found it really stimulating. I found it very easy to relate to. And it did throw up a whole series of things for me, one of which was the whole paradigm of competition that, that we grow up in societies such as the one we're in, where there is this sort of hero-zero dichotomy that you're either fundamentally really successful or you're a loser. And this notion of loser, which seems to have gained great currency in the last 25 years, is, is compassionate mindfulness in a way the antidote to the anxiety people have about competition? Mm. It is. <laughs> <laughs> the reason, the reason what it is, is because it's a different motivational system, right? Everything is about balance in the end. Okay, so some competition is, is, is important, but the point that you're making is that everything now is judged by competition. Yeah. Everything is judged by competition, and so people are caught up in social comparison, envy, self-criticism, the fear of being a failure, the fear of being a loser. Uh, and so on and so on. So those dynamics of competition are a serious problem. What's interesting, okay, is how the, a combination of politics, the media and business have formed an unlikely, well, unlikely coalition to kind of convince us that this is a way of living. Whereas after the Second World War, we had politicians throughout the world, actually, for about 15 years, who understood that we had to rebuild our societies. We were nest builders, and both in Australia and also in England, we started to build health services and schools and so on and so on. We had no money, we, in all our cities we bombed, we owed the Americans millions. And yet that desire to build a cooperative, compassionate world um, created a huge change in people. And then gradually, 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 we moved back to the me first competitive society. And we we've lost those basic motivations. But I think they are rekindleable. I think when people can recognize that we do need a more cooperative society, a society that works together, a society that looks after each other, a society that, you know, particularly for Christian societies, that cares for the poor, and cares for the sick. Those are the two key things of Christianity, caring for the poor, caring for the sick, right? So if we want to be a Christian society, we have to do that. Um, I was staggered, to be honest, by the information in your book that of, of the, the huge impact of mental health issues in contemporary society. I, I may have this the wrong way around, but I, I think it, for women it's it's the, the greatest health yeah, yeah. Uh, issue yeah, and yeah, for men yeah. it's yeah. second. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it, it might be as a you know, casual use of the term epidemic, but the idea suddenly struck me just, just how widespread and how deep issues of mental distress are. Are you optimistic about mindful compassion? Do you think that mindful compassion gives us a tool that one day we'll look back and those statistics will have changed? I mean, I think it's easy to be pessimistic, but I think that in terms of compassion, right, if you take the long view, the 
the long, say over the last 2,000 years, we no longer have the Roman games. We no longer hang people, hang draw and quarter people. You're not allowed to torture people in England, whereas up until 1648, most cities had a torture chamber. Go and look at the Tower of London. So, you know, we 200 years ago, we, we stopped slavery. Of course, there's still slavery in the world, but we're working towards that. Pedophilia now, you know, even 50 years ago, that wasn't an issue. So the key thing is gradually, 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 we are becoming a much more compassionate um, society, a much more compassionate world. It's going to be slow. We have huge uh, issues in terms of fairness, in terms of poverty, in terms of um, domestic violence and so on. Uh, helping children grow up in a world where they feel loved and valued, absolutely. But I think increasingly uh, many individuals, both scientists and uh, ordinary people and all, all kinds of people, are wanting to create a better world. And gradually we are. So I think in the long term, the, the prospects are good, and I think children are growing up now, uh, becoming more aware of the importance of cooperative compassion, mindful compassion. Mindfulness is reaching out into the schools now, so the long term, perhaps not in your, my lifetime, but the long term signs are, are good. We have to deal with the issues of tribalism, we have to deal with the issues of the leaders that we have, because as you pointed out, the leaders that we have tend to be the more unsavory characters, unfortunately, so we have to deal with that. But on the whole, if you take the long term, humanity is moving to a, a more compassionate, less aggressive, less nasty um, uh, way of being. Paul, it's a wonderful book and I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.